Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is for the months of October, November, and December of 2016. This particular lesson is Lesson 5 in that series for October 29 of 2016, entitled, Curse the Day. Curse the day? Do we want to have a le whole lesson about curse the day? What, what's that all about? Well, you'll find out as we study along. So don't go away. Stay with us. We'd like to ask you to join us in prayer as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we dig deeper into the book of Job, we recognize that there's some really serious, important questions being raised. Now as Job struggles with his own existence and why and why not. Help us to understand what he was trying to say to us and what the rest of Scripture says, even the words of Jesus. May it help us to have greater trust and greater faith in you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you read all the way through the book of Job recently? Fortunately for us, but unfortunately, unfortunately for Job, we know about Job 1 and 2 and Job 42. Think how different the story of Job would be if he had known about Job 1 and 2 and 42 before the whole story started. Or even during the story. Even during the story. But he did not. Have you tried to imagine yourself going through the experience of Job, even, even the experience of Job's wife? Not, not, not even Job himself, his wife. Try to imagine it. Can you imagine yourself reduced to mourning and grieving, sitting on a pile of ashes? When tragedy strikes, it is human nature to try to find someone or something to blame. In ancient times, when no apparent reason could be found for something awful that happened, it was customary in polytheistic societies, those are places where there's multiple gods, you try to blame a bad god. There were some bad gods and some good gods, so if something bad happened, it was the bad god doing it. But what do you do if, there's only, if you believe there's only one god? Judaism and Islam and Christianity believe in are, are we, what we call monotheistic religions. We believe there is only one God. So what do you do if an evil thing happens and you only have one God that you can blame it on? Either blame it on God or blame it on yourself. Oh, you can't blame it on yourself. I mean, that would be a terrible thing to do, right? Well, Job believed in only one God. He couldn't explain why all these terrible things were happening to him, and certainly we can understand that. So in that context, it, Job finally came to the conclusion it might be better for him just to die. Let God, God let me rest in death rather than going on to living this unexplainable life. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself what kind of a place Job lived in? Did he have a, some kind of a re stable house, or did he just live in a tent? I mean, with all those animals. Now, I'm sure he had lots of herders and so forth working for him, so at that point in time, maybe he didn't need to be moving around, but... Well, it mentions the older, oldest br uh, brother's house, and that the mm -hmm. wind struck the four corners of the house, whether that means simply yeah. a tent, and we just translated his house, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Sounds a little bit more like a solid structure, doesn't it? Yeah. So, and it, it seems to suggest that later on as we get in the, into the book and he talks about the people who come around and it doesn't sound so much, it sounds more like he's in a community of some kind. Well, and then the next question would be if he lost everything from, from, from chapter one, it seems like he lost everything, his children, his animals, everything. Did he have any kind of reserves stored up somewhere? Did he have even some gold or whatever so that, I mean, or was he just totally reduced to absolute poverty? We don't know. Well, here's his response. His, Job's initial response to all that in Job 3, starting from verse 1 up to verse 10. 
Finally, Job broke the silence and cursed the day on which he had been born. O oh God, put a curse on the day I was born. Put a curse on the night when I was conceived. Turn that day into darkness, God. Never again remember that day. Never again let light shine on it. Make it a day of gloom and thick darkness. Cover it with clouds and blot out the sun. Blot that night out of the year and never let it be counted again. Make it a barren, joyless night. Tell the sorcerers to curse that day, those who know how to control Leviathan. Keep the morning star from shining. Give that night no hope of dawn. Curse that night for letting me be born, for exposing me to trouble and grief. Is um, Sounds like depression. Sounds like depression. Is, is, is Job gotten out of his... What was he really saying there? <clears throat> He's saying, I, I wish I were dead, basically. I, I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. I feel bad. He's ba well, he's basically saying that that day was a bad day. <laughs> well, it was a really, really bad day. <laughs> a really, really, really bad day. Ten, ten I mean, how can you... Children and uh, all of his If you were to express stuff, yes. how, how bad it should be, that's how you would do it. Okay, who sustains our lives minute by minute and hour by hour, day by day, month by month? God. God. Where would you find that in the Bible? There's a couple of verses that are pretty clear. Look at Acts 17, 25, and then verse 28. This is Paul's sermon to the people at Athens, who were obviously pagans, didn't know anything about Yahweh that he was talking about. But he says, nor does he, that is his God, need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And then dropping down to verse 28, as someone has said, one of their poets, it turns out, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the yep. breath of all mankind. Yep. Now he, we're, You're getting ahead of us. That comes up later in the lesson, but let's say thank you. Well, modern science has struggled with the question, what is life? In fact, they cannot even define exactly what life is or what separates life from death. Is a bacteria alive? Okay, Gordon, is a bacteria alive? Absolutely. Is a virus alive? No. Well, see, somebody made up their mind. <laughs> yeah. It gets someone else to do the reproducing for it. Yeah. The virus. But it does, it does most of the things that live, thing, that live things do. And we have this almost a spectrum between things which we call alive and things which, yeah, all the way down to chemicals which we know are not alive. Well, have you ever wondered in a moment of despair whether your life was worth anything? There's an ancient Greek legend about the god Dionysius, who was the god of wine, I remind you, and his friend Silenus, who was drunk on most of the time. And this is what happened. When intoxicated, Silenus was said to possess special knowledge and the power of prophecy. This is paganism, you understand. The Phrygian king Midas, what's Midas known for? Everything he touches turns to gold. Everything he touched turned to gold. Was eager to learn from Silenus and caught the old man by lacing a fountain from which Silenus often drank. As Silenus fell asleep, the king's servants seized and took him to their master. Selena shared with the king a pessimistic prophecy saying then the, that the best thing for a man is not to be born and if already born to die as soon as possible. <laughs> what do you think about that? Quite that's a, that's a <laughs> written way to live. <laughs> yeah. Another depressed statement. Yes. That was, that was written in the writings of Plutarch which is in a modern translation. Um, and if you want to look it up at the if you, and if you get our handout, which, you, which is available on our website at theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G, you look there under Sabbath School and you'll see the handouts for this week. And there's the, the website where you can go and look that up for yourself. Almost all of us have gone through times of discouragement, perhaps even depression, but eventually things usually work out for the better. So for Christians, it is, is it helpful to recognize that God himself has come to this earth and lived and died for us? 
Is it helpful to recognize that there's a future immortal life possible for each one of us? That may not, may not take the current pain away, but it would give us something to look forward to. And I find that to be very true. Uh, when things get really difficult and it seems like everything's going against you, you say, no, I know for sure there's something up ahead. And we have something to look forward to, and you can move on, can't you? Well, look at the next section of Job 3, starting with verse 11. I wish I had died in my mother's womb or died the moment I was born. Why did my mother hold me on her knees? Why did she feed me at her breast? If I had died then, I would be at rest now, sleeping like the kings and rulers who, rebuild ancient pal who rebuilt ancient palaces. Then I would be sleeping like princes who filled their houses with gold and silver or sleeping like a stillborn child. In the grave, wicked people stop their evil and the tired workers find rest at last. Even prisoners enjoy peace, free from the shouts and harsh commands. Everyone is there, the famous and the unknown, and slaves at last are free. Why let people go on in li living in misery? Why give light to those in grief? They wait for death, but it never comes. They prefer a grave to any treasure. They are not happy until they are dead and buried. God keeps their, for their future hidden and hems them in on every side. Instead of eating, I mourn, and I can never stop groaning. Everything I fear and dread comes true. I have no peace, no rest, and my troubles never end. What kind of a life would that be? Well, if every movement is painful, and you can't even, it's impossible really to sleep, is it any wonder that Job thought it would, be, it would have been better never to have been born? Or to die when you're first born? It, it would be an almost unimaginable tragedy. You know, I have two children to, to lose one of them. But what if losing 10 children all at the same time? I mean, how, how, how do you survive something like that? Did, did Job and his wife have time to, to mourn the loss of their children? Well, later in the book, we're going to learn that Job's friends actually claimed that those children must have deserved to die. Look at Job 8, verse 4. Maybe I should read that. You, you might find it hard to believe. These people who supposedly knew everything, your children must have sinned against God, and so he punished them as they deserved. I mean, these were... We have every evidence to believe that God's, uh, Job's children were saints. What would you say if some so-called friend is making those kind of accusations at you about your children? you got friends like that, you don't need any enemies, yeah, huh? That's right. A little well, Job, was, there. Yeah. Job was concerned about possibility of that since mm -hmm. they were children themselves, so he uh, offered a sacrifice for them every day. So... Uh, so in some sense, he had them covered, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so it didn't make sense to him even then. No. That uh, it was because of their sin. So there were pagan concepts were current back then, weren't they? Yeah. Well, as Job was talking about dying, it is important to notice his ideas about what happens when one dies. Did he dream of going directly to heaven? Is there any evidence of it? <coughs> Excuse me. Is there any evidence for that? Talks about a resurrection. Yeah, Job 29, uh, 29 verses 25 and 26. But no, I, I'm talking about not, not I will not, see God sometime no. in the future. I'm talk, did he think he was going to go straight to heaven and live in floating on a cloud playing a harp? I don't think so. No. He didn't. Did he, did, none of those things were mentioned. Instead, Job talked about lying quietly in the grave asleep at rest. Look at Job verse 13 if I had died then I would be at rest now sleeping like the kings and rulers who rebuilt ancient palaces so what did he think was going to happen well look at Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 yes the living know they are going to die but the dead know nothing they have no further reward they are completely forgotten their loves, their hates, their passions all died with them 
they will never again take part in anything that happens in this world. Is that true? No, not really. Not if they're good people, right? Well, it's this world, I guess. Yeah, they would say no more in this world. It, it's in the new world that they'll have a part. Well, Jesus said this, and remember that the time when he was near the end of his life, near the end of his ministry, and someone came rushing to him from Bethany, and what did they tell him that, was ha that happened? Lazarus is sick. Lazarus is seriously sick. So what did Jesus say? Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, If he is asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I'm glad that I was not with him so that you will believe. Let us go to him. Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us all go with the teachers that we may die with him. So what did Jesus think about death? Sleep. sleep. Death is only an extended sleep until the Lord calls us back to life again, either at the second coming or the third coming. Look at John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice. How many will hear his voice? All of them. All the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live. Those who have done, we would say, at the second coming. Those who have done evil will rise and be condemned at the third coming. Right? Okay. So let's talk about the nature of man or the state of, a, the state of human beings and death for a moment. Genesis 2, verse 7. There it is on the screen. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. I think it's um, important to notice that the modern versions don't say he took some dust. Have you ever tried to mold dust? <laughs> well, you kind of wonder, how else would he explain that to the people he wrote that for originally? Well, you know, the, the Anchor Bible translation says clods. Clods? Clods of dirt. Clods of dirt. Here, here, here it says he took some soil. Soil, you can, you can, you can, you can mold soil. You can put yeah, this. It's still about the same yeah. thing they're talking about there, but, but you know, God isn't going to give them all kinds of technology that we might know about, but not them. So they're going to, he's going to use all that's necessary and that's yeah. you know all the elements are in the soil you get the soil yeah you build the body out of the elements yeah so well so what does it say it says god took the soil and he made a body out of it he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life and man my version says began to live the king james says what became a living soul became a living soul what is a soul a living being, a person. A living being, a person. It's the combination of a body a with the breath in it. See, the body doesn't have the breath in it. It's not a soul anymore. It's dust. It's back to dust. So what? It, how did Job learn about the state of the dead? It returns to dust, but it doesn't yeah. mean be right then. We, some, the people who want to very technical about this, say we really shouldn't talk about the state of the dead, we should talk about the basic nature of man. Do we have any power in ourselves to sustain our own lives? No. Did God, did God and Job discuss that issue, the nature of man, in some of their previous conversations, or, or did that information come down to Job from his ancestors? What do you think? <clears throat> I think it came down. Okay? Either is possible. <clears throat> Could have been in the direct conversations that God had with Job. Yeah, we yeah. don't know how many ancestors the there were. Yeah. That he would have time to understand that without the conversations with God. Well, if Job himself lived to be more than 200 years old, he probably had conversations with quite a few ancestors, personally. As Christians, we are aware of the wonderful promises of God about the future. 
we are also aware of what has taken place in the past and is now spread out on the pages of sacred history. So if we understand and believe what the Bible says, we will remember what, that what happens in this life is just the blink of an eye in comparison with the lives that God is preparing for us in the better land. In other words, all of us sitting here, how long would God like us to live? Forever. Forever. So the life on this earth, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, five minutes or it's 200 years, compared to forever, what happens? It's a blink of an eye, isn't it? No comparison. No comparison at all. So, as we will note a little later, most of the book of Job consists of Job speaking, and then one or more of his friends responding, and then Job answering their response, and back and forth it goes. So in Job 4 and 5, Eliphaz, one of Job's great friends, gives his first speech. And we'll examine, that's, a, that's an incredible speech, we'll look at it more next week. But in Job 6 and 7, Job continued his speech. And, and he says, If my troubles and griefs were weighed on scales, they would weigh more than the sands of the sea, so my wild words should not surprise you. Can you weigh ideas on a scale? And then the sands of the sea, that's pretty heavy. What? I mean, that's not even... <laughs> yeah. so what? You know that's a metaphor. Yeah, exactly. So what is, what's Job trying to say to us? He, 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 Job is trying to think of the biggest, heaviest thing he can think of. Right? And that's how depressed he is. Mm -hmm. Well, surely this lament is an example of the fact that Job was struggling to think of some metaphor that was large enough to be compared to his suffering and pain. We can never truly feel the pain of another individual. We can have sympathy for them, and that sympathy may cause us pain, but that pain is ours, not theirs. It is not possible for us to really feel anyone else's pain or suffering. Do you agree with that premise? Uh, I, well, you can't hook up wires to the person and feel it that way, but um, you can see that it would be similar to something maybe you've experienced, but it won't be exactly the same. Well, this is not to suggest that there's nothing like compassion or pity or empathy. We believe in those things. But when we have compassion or empathy, we are taking a certain amount of psychological pain on us, and that as a result of our sympathy for them, but that pain then becomes ours and, and really not theirs. We don't, we can't, I can't say, okay, you're really suffering today, you, you know, your mother just passed away or something like that, so I'm going to take part of your pain away and I'm going to endure it. You can't. You can say, I'm sorry, and maybe it, you feel better because you have someone sympathizing with you, but you still have the same amount of pain. Well, surely we would recognize that only Jesus can fully understand and commiserate with our pain. He has explored the depths of pain and suffering for each of us. In fact, the pain he felt was on a level we can hardly comprehend. Consider these words about the cross. Now, remember... Jesus is up there. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's been, they put a crown of thorns on his head, etc. And now he's with his back all ripped up from the torture and he's bleeding and he's hanging on the cross with nails to his hands and his feet. And these are what it, this is what Ellen White says about that in Desire of Ages 751, paragraph 1. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony. What, what agony? Mental. Mental. Yeah. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. He was so concerned about being separated from his father that the physical pain was next to nothing. We, 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 we can't imagine. Every time we sin, what we're, what we're doing is we're voluntarily separating ourselves from God. Do we feel terrible pain when we do that? Can we even understand what it means? 
to feel pain because of being separated from God. Well, in Scripture, God has promised that he will help us when we're tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, Every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. And, of course, that's, again, my Good News Bible. Does it help? to know that God will not allow us, quote, to be tested beyond our power to remain firm. Does that mean if you're close to God and you're a relatively righteous person, that God says, okay, fine, you can suffer more? Well, what did it, wait, Jesus, and I bring up John the Baptist again, that poor fellow, mm -hmm. he, no record, he says, you've done the, the least of these, you went and visited your people in prison and so forth. Poor John the Baptist, what he went through, and then, of course, obviously Jesus. Can't Je underestimate that. Yeah, and Jesus said that if they hated me, they'll hate you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In this world, you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Yeah. Think about the people who lived back before the flood. How long did they live? A thousand years. Yeah. Close, Close to, to it. it. Methuselah lived 969 years. Adam lived 930 years. Many of them lived in thing, years in that, in that range. Um, but even that much is just a blink of an eye in, in, in comparison to eternity, right? Do we recognize, do we recognize every day that this brief existence, which is really nothing more than a puff of smoke or a wisp of wind, that's what Job calls it, is just a preparation for eternity? Look at Job 7, 1 to 11. Human life is like forced army service. That sounds exciting. <laughs> like a life of hard manual labor, like slaves longing for cool shade, like workers waiting for their pay. Month after month, I have nothing to live for. Night after night brings me grief. When I lie down to sleep, the hours drag. I toss all night and long for dawn. My body is full of worms. It is covered with scabs. Well, it makes your skin crawl just to think about it, doesn't it? Pus runs out of my sores. My days pass by without hope, pass faster than a weaver's shuttle. Remember, O oh God, my life was only a breath. My happiness has already ended. You see me now, but never again. If you look for me, I'll be gone. Like a cloud that fades and is gone, people die and never return. They are forgotten by all who knew them. Is that true? Has Job been forgotten? No. So if you went to him and said, well, Job, you know, this is just a, this is just a puff of time and all eternity. Would that make him feel better? It's eternity right then. Yeah. <laughs> well, believing and accepting that you're like, yes? Well, in, in asking to die, he's sort of asking to enter into eternity where there's rest and peace and, mm -hmm. and hope and and such as opposed to what he's experiencing right now. Yeah. But it's just a few couple days. I mean, it's a few weeks, yeah. maybe a couple of years, but what is that compared to eternity? Yeah. So you should be, yeah. should be happy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Cheer up. Cheer up, yeah. Believing, <laughs> believing and accepting that your life is nothing more than a puff of wind could be really a problem if we did not have promises for the future. Well, it's interesting to notice that in Job 6 and 7, Job goes from wishing that he could die. Let's just look at those verses really quick. Job 6, 8 to 10. Why won't God give me what I ask? Why won't he answer my prayer? If only he would go ahead and kill me. If, he, if I knew he would, I would leap for joy, no matter how great my pain, I, my pain. I know that God is holy. I have never opposed what he commands. So there he's wishing he could die. But look at Job 7, 7 to 11. Remember, O oh God, my life is only a breath. My happiness has already ended. You see me now, but never again. If you look for me, I'll be gone like a cloud that fades and is gone. We just read it a moment ago. Basically, he's, he's bemoaning the fact that life is so short, right? Is that a contradiction in ideas? How much did Joe... He's jo trying to understand life, you know. Yeah. That, you know, <laughs> what, what are you doing, God, you know? <laughs> are you 
if you only give us a short amount of time. Yeah. Uh, and I, and right now I'm experiencing all this tribulation yeah. and the pain and suffering. So, what what is life about? Yeah. What, how much did Job know about the future life? We don't know. So whether our lives are good or bad, blessed or cursed, they only last a very brief time considering the perspective of eternity. Well, here's what Job said in Job 19, 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, Yet in my flesh I shall see God. In other words, me, not, not some other version of me, me, I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Which raises a question. A little while later, we're going to find out that God takes four chapters to talk to Job. Did Job see him? He says he did at the end. In the whirlwind. Saw the whirlwind. Yeah. Does, did the whirlwind speak? Well, maybe the sound came out of it. Yeah. Well, Job goes on there in chapter 7 to raise a lot of questions. Why are human beings so important to you? Why pay attention to what they do? You inspect them every morning and test them every minute. Won't you look away long enough for me to swallow my spittle? Are you harmed by my sin, your jailer? Why use me for your target practice? Am I so great a burden to you? Can't you ever forgive my sin? Can't you pardon the wrong I do? Soon I will be in the grave and I'll be gone when you look for me. Does that sound like a good Christian talking? <laughs> As Gordon says, it sounds like a depressed man. But yeah. if you had spent every day talking with God, and telling your children about God and mm -hmm. going through all this with your family and then suddenly your family's gone. You go, well, I still have God. God won't leave me. And, and then, then you don't have that conversation. You don't have that backup. And you're painting every square inch of your skin is pain. It seemed to Job like God was punishing him nonstop. Job was begging for just a little bit of respite. How he must have longed for a comfortable night's sleep. He was asking if God didn't have something else to do besides causing him all that pain. Job's arguments and statements in these, in these two or three chapters that we have looked at raise one of the great existential questions. Why are we here? Included in that question is the second question. What are we? Men, women, what are we? Who are we? Where do we come from? Surely Job couldn't understand why in God's vast universe, God and Satan seem to be focusing their attention only on him. Would you like God and Satan to be focusing their attention on you? Well, many of our Christian friends believe that nothing we do here on this earth can really affect God in any way. They said that he is sovereign, He's way up there above us. He doesn't have even the time to bother himself with the minor things that trouble us. The whole story of Job is a clear rebuttal of that argument. But there are many people who consider Christianity as basically irrelevant to life in our times. Why is that? Are they a fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Peter 3? Look at these verses from 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. Do you think there's any people living today whose lives are controlled by their own lusts? They will mock you and will ask you, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Does that sound a little bit like evolution. They purposefully ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water and it was also by water, the waters, uh, water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. But the heavens and the earth that now exist 
are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. But do not forget one thing, my friends, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with the shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in that way, I mean, this way, what kind of people should, we, should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. A day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, newer heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. You think righteousness is at home today in this world? Well, here's what uh, one modern critic said in light, of, in light of what we just read. In an era so unprecedentedly illuminated by science and reason, the good news of Christianity became less and less convincing, a metaphysical structure, less secure a foundation upon which to build one's life, and less psychologically necessary. The sheer improbability of the whole nexus of events was becoming painfully obvious. You know, look at the story of God coming down to this earth and that whole thing. It, it just, such, a, such an incredible e combination of things, yeah, it couldn't have happened. An infinite, eternal God would suddenly become a particular human being in a, spectac in a specific historic time and place only to be ignominiously executed? that a single brief life taking place two millennia earlier in an obscure primitive nation on a planet now known to be a relatively insignificant piece of matter revolving around one star among billions in an inconceivably vast and impersonal universe, that such an uh, undistinguished event should have any overwhelming cosmic or eternal meaning could no longer be a compelling belief for reasonable men. It was starkly implausible that the universe as a whole would have any pressing interest in this minute part of its immensity, if it had any interest at all. Under the spotlight of the modern demand for public, empirical, scientific corroboration of all statements of belief, the essence of Christianity withered. Richard Tarnas, uh, Passion of the Western Mind. So how would you respond to that? Does that sound like a fulfillment of Second Peter three, uh, he's just a materialist. A materialist. Yeah, he's just materialistic. He's one of those guys. Well, Richard Is, Doc, Dawkins. Dawkins uh, was asked why he be, became an atheist, and he said, "Well, it was evolution. From an early age, he could see that." And then he goes on to say that that there's. Uh, the, that the evangelical Christians have it right. There is no compatibility between Christianity and evolution. He says that there are certain sophisticated theologians who are comfortable with it, but he says, I think they're deluded. Um, so there's, there's no compatibility. Uh, you, uh, you look at, I mean, this person obviously doesn't feel that there's any real value to things, you know. We're so ins uh, insignificant here. That's one of the arguments, you know, if you've got. Yeah. But, um, I mean, a, a germ might seem ins insignificant in terms of a population, but if, it's, if it starts to grow and has a host and then that's ho passed on to others, it can have, have great significance even though it started off as something small. So sometimes, that's the argument. Well, we're so insignificant, this small planet, you know, in right. this huge universe. Um, why should we be special? Uh, but uh, but size doesn't make a difference. It's well, for 
and, and, and I can tell you in the field of medicine now, we're seeing more and more, they're saying, I won't believe anything unless you have a randomized, controlled trial to prove it. Well, what happens? Can you prove, could you prove anything from history if you only accept randomized, controlled trials? That's a different kind of science. Completely different. And even there, there can be conflicts. You can have one set of forensic scientists on this side of the courtroom and another on the other yeah. side, and they're trying to sort through recent events, and they can come to different conclusions. Yeah. How much more so when it's thousands of years old? Well, our lesson is challenging us to, to ask the question, is it irrational to believe in anything that cannot be proven by science or reason? Well, if you're a materialismist, that's your whole universe right there. You just mm -hmm. don't deny everything else. So, why do you think it is that the skeptics are not questioning the writings of Aristotle, Plato, or Socrates? Why very, do they? Very well, few they, copies of those, that's one for sure. They, well, there's only they kind about of eight used, copies. They kind of used reason as a basis for understanding everything, didn't uh -huh. they? Um, they just sort of thought it through and said, this is how it must be. But that's not an excuse for superstition either, right? Well, there's a lot of things in history that cannot be proven by reason or science. By the way, I, I found a quote here from a fellow by Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Science is a belief in ignorance of, ep of experts. <laughs> science is a belief in the ignorance of ep experts. experts. I see. <laughs> okay. Well, Christians believe that God has not only become man, but also that he will return. And after the millennium, he will turn this tiny little blue marble in space into his future headquarters. Wow. And we're told, Ellen White, Christ's Object License, page 69, paragraphs 1 and 2, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. What will the skeptics have to say on that day? Well, so in that, that, that existential question, what is man or what is woman? How would you answer that? And would your answer be different than the answer of an evolutionist or an atheist? You asked a question there, Ben, about what will they ask at that day? You're talking about that the second coming? Yeah. Well, what does it say in Revelation 6? It's yeah. not very pretty. What they're going to ask for the rocks and the mountains the, to yeah. fall on them and so forth, the kings of the earth, the great men and generals, the rich and the strong and so forth. Yeah. Not a very pretty picture. No. Do you think, I mean, I mean, some of us, several of us here, most of us, in fact, have somewhat, somewhat of a scientific background. Do you feel that our understanding of the state of the dead or the nature of man is more plausible from a scientific point of view and more satisfying from a religious point of view than the ideas proposed by those who believe in the immortality of the soul? Yes. Yeah. Those who believe in the immortality of the soul, they often worry about whether Uncle Jack will make it or not or whether he's frying <laughs> down there. It's yeah. Well, while there are many people in our day who choose to take their own lives and or the lives of others, most of us who do our, would do our best, very best, to cling to life. Why is that? Are we just afraid of the unknown? What does the cross teach us about the value of human life? God has told us that Jesus Christ would have died for a just one of us. Uh, one place where that's mentioned is in the writings of Ellen White, volume 8 of the Testimonies, page 72, paragraph 3. The cross shows us how far God will go uh -huh. to demonstrate and to win over his creatures to his way of thinking. What makes the Bible stories believable? 
irrational. Mm -hmm. They don't cover over the, the sins of the saints. In fact, they, they exploit the sin. I mean, they, they blow up. The, they spend a lot of time talking about the sins of the saints. Would we have ever heard about Jesus Christ if he had not risen from the grave? He would have been like every other. The disciples would have faded into oblivion. There never would have been a word written about him. But we know about John the Baptist mm -hmm. who didn't rise. Yeah. We know about all the Old Testament things that all the Old Testament prophets that didn't rise. Yes, but they were pointing to the one. I understand we, that. We would I'm have, just pointing out the... that. My, my point that, is we would have an Old Testament. Yes. We would be like the Jews. Yes. We would not have a New Testament. Yeah. And without the New Testament, where would we be? Well, without the understanding that we get from the Gospels, the, the life and teachings of Jesus, we would not make, couldn't make sense of the Old Testament. Yeah. How pervasive is the belief in the immortality of the soul? And where did those ideas come from? The lie of the devil. Directly from the devil himself. Look at Genesis 3. These are very familiar words. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? And the, we, we, we usually just sort of read over that. But the Hebrew implies God told you you can't eat of any of these trees. That's what the snake is asking. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman asked, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. That's not true. What's Satan saying? God is a liar. God is a liar. Half truth. Well, how did you respond when a friend or loved one died? We believe that that, kind, that person is sleeping or that she or he has no awareness of what is happening here on earth or anywhere else for that matter at this time. She or he awaits the, awaits the day of her or his resurrection. Is that a more satisfying belief than the idea that they're floating around on a cloud somewhere looking down on us? So, in this lesson, the book of Job, do the ideas that we've been talking about seem kind of moribund, or not moribund, but morbid to you? Do you think, do you think suicide could ever be an option? Is suicide pr forbidden by God? Killing, or death, excuse me, uh, killing is... Uh uh, suicide specifically is actually forbidden. Right. Yeah. We're bought with a price. It's not our. Or Samson sort of did mm -hmm. in, in the process of his <coughs> killing. And his purpose was not so much to just to kill himself and get out of this, but to destroy his enemies. And in the process, he died. So, mm -hmm. so a little bit re removed from that. Well, when you read the Bible stories, it's you really, really, if you want to really learn from the Bible stories, you need to try to put yourself in that place and think about what would you have done, how well do you understand the context of that in that story. Well, there's an old Native American proverb that says that in order to understand a man, one should walk a mile in his moccasins. Could we do that with the story of Job? We've already suggested that much of the book of Job is written in poetic form. Now, this is not the poem, poems as we know them with rhyme and rhythm. Uh, the, the Hebrews, their idea of poetry is what we call parallelism. An example is Job 8, verse 3. And from the New King James Version, it says, Does God subvert justice? How does the Almighty pervert justice? So what do we see there? We see the same idea given in different words, repeated. That's, that's the idea of Hebrew parallelism. But 
uh, there's also a second aspect to Hebrew poetry, and that's it uses very potent, potent uh, imagery. And many, much of it's from, from natural settings, from the field, from the, you know, the lake, from the, stuff from the farmyard. Um, and these images come largely from everyday life in ancient times. So in this lesson, we have focused on some laments from Job. We need to recognize that they are, in fact, laments. But he went on to the right place with his laments. He went directly to God. And we are told, and this is from Ellen White again, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5.11. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. I mean, just imagine that. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul, no joy cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips, of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant, or in which he takes no immediate interest. Everything, in other words, every single thing that happens to each one of us, God cares about it. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up the wounds, Psalm 147, verse 3. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for which he gave his beloved son. Steps to Christ, page 100. So there's another, I mentioned earlier, volume 8 of the testimonies. Here's another place, basically, where God says, I would have died for one person. Just imagine that. Well, finally, let us look briefly at the, at the structure of the book of Job, just to sort of have it in mind as we move on. There's the prologue. That's Job 1 and 2. It's written in prose. And then there's Job's first lament. And now we're, we're, we're talking poetry. That's Job 3. From this point onward until Job 42, verse 7, it's all written in poetry. And then three, there's a first cycle of dialogues. Jo Eliphaz speaks in Job 4 and 5. Job, speak in verse, Job speaks in verses, I mean, in chapter 6 and 7. Bildad, chapter 8. Job, chapters 9 and 10. Zophar, jo, uh, Job 11. Job again, Job 12 to 14. Then there's a second cycle of dialogues. Eliphaz, jo, uh, Job 15. Job speaks in Job 16. Bildad speaks in Job 18. Job speaks in... Job 19, and Zophar speaks in Job 20, and finally Job responds in Job 22. Then there's a third cycle of dialogues. Now this one's a little more not so clear. Um, Eliphaz, Eliphaz clearly speaks in Job 22. Job speaks in Job 23 and 24. Bildad probably speaks in Job 25. Job speaks in Job 26 and 27. But there's a possibility that Job 24 verses 18 to 25 may be from Zophar and Job, speaking in 26, 5 to 14, may be from Bildad. So it's possible that for some reason, in some places it's pretty clear who's talking, and the very, this last section is not always absolutely clear. Then there's Job, Job's monologue in Job 28 to 31. We look forward to that. Then there's Elihu's speech in Job 32 to 37. There are some incredible statements in that. And finally, there's God's response and Job's repentance in Job 38 through 42, verse 6, and then, of course, the epilogue, Job 42, 7 through 17. It's written in prose, but the real conclusion to the story of Job is in the epilogue. These cycles end up being fairly repetitive. Job spoke, and then one of his friends responded, whereupon Job spoke again, another friend responded, Many of the same points were repeated by Job's friends. We have spoken briefly about what Job said regarding his understanding of the state of the dead. 
Job talked about human life as being fleeting. Job 14.2, contrasting human mortality with God's ex exclusive immortality, which is mentioned in 1 Timothy 6.16. Then he compared human death to a sleep. Job 14, 10 to 12, it's just one of those, many, many places. Compare Psalm 13, 3 and Jeremiah 51, 39 and 57, Daniel 12, verse 2, I mean, on and on, during which there is no conscious state, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. So, as there is harmony in Scripture and continuity between the Old and New Testaments, this imagery of death as a sleep is taken up in the New Testament and applied in the most dramatic way by Jesus himself to the death of his friend Lazarus, which we read about John 11, verses 11 to 14. His disciples and apostles reiterated throughout their writings this understanding of death as sleep. Acts 7, verse 60, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17, 2 Peter 3, verse 4, it goes on and on. Finally, the closing scenes of the book of Revelation refer to a time when there will be no more suffering of death, Revelation 21, 1 to 4, followed a, following a resurrection to eternal life or to final destruction, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, Revelation 2, 11, 20, verse 14, and 20, 21, verse 8. Because of the commonly held view that God will stoke the fires of hell, where the wicked will be tortured for eternity, many have been led to come to the conclusion that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. The eternally burning hell is necessary if humans are naturally immortal, as Satan claims, and if some of us are not fit to be taken to heaven, what's God going to do with us? Take us to hell, send us to hell. You can read all these verses we've been talking about in our, in our handout, which is on our, the, our uh, website at theox.org. Thus, Satan's first lie, as recorded in Genesis 3, has led many people to reject God. So what did Job say about the state of the living? You can read about those verses. In a previous lesson, we spoke quite extensively about theodicy and our understanding of the great controversy. And I would repeat my point from that lesson. It's impossible, I believe, to put all these things together and understand them as a rational human being without an understanding of the great controversy and the conflict between God and the devil and Satan's accusations against God and God's response. And we'll be re talking about that a great deal more in the book of Job. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've spoken about many things, many of which we probably don't know nearly all that we would need to know to speak intelligently about them. But the book of Job challenges us to do so. We thank you for giving us this material. We look forward to the day when we will gather around your throne and have all these stories explained to us in much better detail. May that day come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.